Now my friends, walks are Bob Amming games and Disney is its own. So, Glitter Force. How does one approach this? Should I compare it against its source material or judge it by its own merits? Should I bring up the episodes that were skipped over? Should I be concerned about certain new policies? Oh boy, so much to consider. Okay, first of all, I'll try to judge Glare Force by its own merits. I'll still have a natural bias, and we'll bring up little tidbits here and there just because I'm a bit of a stickler for details. But I'll try to look at Glare Force as its own thing based mainly on its writing and presentation. Second, I'll stick talking about the missing episodes in a separate vehicle. Convenient adaptation, right? Here. Third, about the new policies. I don't know, I'll just say whatever the hell I want and work it out from there. There's 20 episodes in the second season and 40 altogether, so we've got a lot to cover. But I'll try to keep it as condensed as possible. So let's see if Glare Force has truly earned its spot as one of the few magical girl anime on Netflix, alongside Madoka Magica, Yuki Yuna, and the irregular at Magic High School. Seriously, go look it up. For whatever reason, Netflix got their thumbnails mixed up. Still, one more might actually be able to make that anime a little bit more watchable. Before we get to probably the biggest point of contention with this series, let's talk technicals first. Whatever opinions you might have towards the source material, you gotta admit, Smile Precure is one of the nicer Precure seasons of recent memory that doesn't have Princess in the title. The colors are nice and bright, and the animation is fairly consistent throughout, so Based on solely that, Saban probably chose a good first Precure season to adapt. Just too bad they didn't get some better video. Yeah, for whatever reason, during some of the more vividly animated scenes, the colors suddenly get a lot darker and the frame rate takes a significant drop. Insert any game company's crappy port here. Now of course, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, so maybe no one's really at fault. But still, if fan subbers could get better quality footage, why couldn't Saban? Just saying. This especially became more noticeable during this second season as we were entering into the series' third act where some of the most intense battles were taking place. Really, this is pretty disheartening, especially when you consider the series was directed by Takashi Otsuka, who's probably one of the best damn Precure directors having done the original All-Stars movie trilogy, hence why the final boss of this series ended up looking a little familiar. Nowadays, he does mostly storyboarding, which is a real shame because anyone who can make scripts written by Shoji Yonemura good deserves an award. Again, I don't know if they were just unable to get some higher quality transfers or if there were some compression issues, but as is, this is kind of hard to look at. Not the worst quality, but you can just tell it could have been so much more. Still, it's nothing really ugly or horrible to look at, like say, uh... Oh god. Okay, I don't know what art college they plucked from to get the guy who made these ending dances, but I think they need to rethink their curricular if this is the end result. The uncanny valley here is almost Akonohana levels of nightmare inducing. Don't blink. Don't even blink. Blink and you're dead. I won't hold whatever this is against the show all that much, as it is just the outro. But if they were trying to give people who are watching this on Netflix reason to hit the skip forward button, then they succeeded with flying colors, that's for sure. Moving on to a more subjective area of presentation, let's talk sound. Now, I already went over my feelings on the voice acting in my first impressions video, and they're pretty much the same here. I like Laura Bailey's performance as Emily, and Lily still sounds kind of off to me, but I've got a little bit more used to it. The music I felt was decent. Blush's songs were catchy, even if the opening was kind of overused. They played every time they were about to defeat the monster of the week. I mean seriously, when has Saban ever found success with a series where they played the opening over and over in a big fight and... Okay, point taken. That said, and this is probably one of my biggest issues with the show, the BGM feels kind of... 
schizophrenic. Schizophrenia! What I mean by this is that it often feels like it doesn't know what kind of mood it's trying to set. Whether it wants to be happy, sad, exciting, relaxing, it never seems like it can settle on just one tune. One example is this scene from the 27th episode when the Glare Force has been hypnotized into a near zombie-like state. When your heroines have cold dead eyes like that, I think the accompanying tunes should be more... Silent Hill-esque as opposed to whatever they're playing here. Come on, you've got to remember the Glitter Force! Think about it, you're not trying hard enough! Trying hard is overrated. Yeah, it's way too much work. Thinking hurts. And probably the best example of poor music choice I could find was the 34th episode. There, April's younger siblings were nearly caught in the crossfire during her battle with Bruja. Just look at April's face, she looks terrified at the thought that her siblings are about to die. But the music just never seems to match up with the situation. Oh, how good are your brothers and sisters are playing catch? I think it kind of leans into some more sorrowful tunes, but then I think it ends up looping right back into the battle themes that were playing just a few minutes ago. Uh, <sighs> Here's a good idea. Have a point. Now, of course, I can understand if they just didn't have the budget to make some more specialized BGM, but if that were the case, I think just plain old silence would have been a thousand times more effective in a scene like this. And unfortunately, I still have a few more issues with this particular episode, which we'll get into as we talk about. Boy, and now we reach the big point of contention for a lot of the fans of the original series. Now, as I said, I do kind of want to view this as its own thing and want to give them free reign to do whatever they feel is right for a Western audience to enjoy the series. And I will applaud them for making some necessary changes, like with what they did for episodes 28 and 29 of Smile Pretty Cure. In episode 29 of the original, the girls said that they were still on summer vacation. Even though in the previous episode, they clearly went to school. Great cut, new- No, no, no. You see, in Japan, students attend what's called a tokobi, which is basically a half-school day during their summer vacation, in which they might listen to the principal deliver a speech and then be reminded of the homework they were assigned during their vacation. Yeah, for any of my viewers out there who have kids who complain that summer vacation is too short, just tell them at least they're not in Japan and they don't have to listen to their principal deliver a boring as all hell speech. And of course, a lot of other Western viewers wouldn't be familiar with the Japanese school calendar, thus Glare Force just changed it to say it was indeed the first day of school. In my opinion, this was a good change, as the alternative of trying to write an equivalent of a tokobi into an English subscript would be awkward. Today is a summer service day. Today is a summer service day. <laughs> But then there are those pointless little changes that end up biting the show in the ass later. In episode 30 of Glare Force, out of nowhere, a toddler Lily, long story, decided to play rock, paper, scissors. Now, of course, this made sense in Smile Pretty Cure, where Yayoi playing rock, paper, scissors with the viewers was part of her gimmick. But for whatever reason, the scriptwriters thought it would be a good idea to remove that fun little gimmick and replace it with one of the cringiest catchphrases since. Now, Mom, I'm just watching cartoons made for little girls that expose about the values of love and friendship and... Why are you crying? Really, I think one of the biggest issues with Glare Force's scripts is that they don't take them seriously enough at times. They play it up like they know that they're in a cheesy anime made for little girls, which they are, but it's also a series with some more serious moments, like the aforementioned scene of April almost losing her siblings, which was ruined by both the poor music choice, and some unnecessary lines from the siblings. Again, silence can speak volumes. Now, I did like some of the additional lines, especially from the Monsters of the Week, who got some of the best Wii lines in the series. Please win, Spylock. Who is the wife of the fourth president of the United States? Please get it wrong. Dolly Madison. You got it right. As well as what had to be outlived by Laura Bailey for Emily. Here's what you do. You tell the prince you're sorry, but you have to go, and then you hit the door running. Now let's roll! I'm sorry, but I must go now. I think I left my oven on fire. <laughs> Looks like surf is up! I can't unsee this! I know! Actually, he's pretty good. It's the big beef. 
But for the final 9 episodes of the series, I really think they should have let up on that mentality. For anyone out there wondering why I love Smile Precure so much, it's because of the final 9, which are a string of great episodes. And while Glare Force's scripts do also kind of step it up, I still feel like they lack the emotional impact that the scenario presented. You see, near the end of the series, three of the four evil generals were threatened with termination by their boss, and thus were stepping up their game. In a situation like this, you would want to capitalize on it by making your villains a little bit more sympathetic, while also remaining really threatening since essentially they're on their last leg. But for whatever reason, they felt the need to make some wisecracks and spout out some ill-advised jokes here and there. Thankfully, this does let up a little bit by the end, but then the final battle ended with some of the most cringy lampshading that I'll let you watch for yourself. It might cure you of any constipation you might have. Overall, while I do enjoy some of the show's comedic writing intentional or not, and while it is still far above other dubs out there, I think it might have benefited from 5 to 10 more drafts here and there. So, the question of the hour is, did I think this little experiment of adapting a pre cure season for a western audience was a success? The short answer is... probably no. The long answer, well... While it did slip up in several areas, I would ultimately chalk most of them up to inexperience. In my view, the biggest thing that was holding this series back was the presentation. They really could have used some better quality video, and whoever picked out and mixed the BGM needs to go back to school. Writing was also a bit of a problem, but not for the same reasons for say a 4Kids or Deke adaptation. In the case of those series, they felt comfortable talking down to their audience just because their target demographic was of the younger persuasion, which should never be the case for any show. The flaws of Glare Force's script were the result of some bad comedy and lack of thematic direction, which is far more acceptable than jerk offs who think they understand what the kids like these days. Aside from that, I am again surprised at what they kept in from Smile Precure. I already went over the creepy as all hell eyes and the near death of April's little brothers and sisters, but let's not forget old Joker Rascal as he's known here. From him nearly mind raping Chloe to his on screen death, which I'm not going to show here because A, it's a spoiler, and B, I'd hate to deprive anyone out there of sleep tonight. But yeah, if you told me stuff like this was in a Saban anime adaptation, I would have called you delusional. <laughs> Hell, they even had an episode that had rather heavy Yuri undertones to it, which... Now that I think about it, nah, it's not that big of a surprise these days. But yeah, the amount of actual censorship here was really loose. I think this was a definite benefit from streaming on Netflix. The only bit of censorship I noticed was again a pan-up of a younger Majorina or Bruja's boobs, because yeah, this shot was definitely necessary for an anime made for little girls, wasn't it? Pandering comes in all shapes and forms these days, my friends. Overall, while I wouldn't call Glare Force a resounding success, and I would still recommend the original, it's an admirable first step, and I do applaud the ADR director, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, who from what I saw at this year's Kawaii Con really tried her damnedest with this. Let's face it, bringing the longest running magical girl series to western shores was never going to be an easy task, so take it for what it is, and check it out for yourself if you ever have the time as I think it deserves the support so that we can at least get more Precure adaptations. I'd also recommend the original Precure that's available subbed on Crunchyroll, and I suppose you could watch some fan subs of certain other shows and movies that are on my to-review list. Well, that's all I have to say for now. I hope what I've said has at least given you a slight interest to check out Glare Force. If you have already seen it and have your own thoughts about it, or just want to roast me for enjoying the little girls show, then feel free to comment below. Otherwise, I gotta go work on some other videos that's probably gonna get some hate from some very opinionated fan bases. Yeah, yeah, what else is new for a YouTuber? Anyway, fair off on now, my friends.